Fawcett, and I'm going to start my, my talk to you at this point. Uh, if people come in late, that's also fine. Um, you know, I have been doing these things for many years, and I've often talked in general terms about our work doing new critical editions of the major operatic works of the 19th century, particularly the ones I'm involved with, or the works of Rossini and the works of, of Verdi. The Verdi edition, in fact, is published jointly by the University of Chicago Press and uh, Casa Ricordi of Milan. But we have just printed what I think is one of the best things we've ever done, uh, and it is a new edition of an opera you all know, and that's The Barber of Seville. Uh, this is a work that The Barber of Seville, you know, has been performed all over the place, obviously. This is the new score, and this is the new critical commentary. If it looks big, it is. Uh, now, the question that I think is worth asking is, why on earth do we need a new edition of The Barber of Seville? What for? And what is in this score that makes it of particular worth to performers, to the public? You know, how will it transmit itself at some point or another to you? Well, the first thing to know is that already last year, Lyric Opera used a preliminary version of this score as the basis of their performance. Now, what did they choose to perform? They chose to perform basically the entire opera. That was already a big change, because the Barbara Seville is an opera that traditionally has been cut to ribbons. Uh, you know, you just take a big hacksaw to it and you cut off large sections of it and you think you're doing a good thing. Uh, some of those things that have been cut traditionally really are cuts that only date till the 20th century. They aren't cuts that were typical in the 19th century. Others are cuts that did go back a long way. But there are reasons for omitting some parts of the score, but often the reasons have been misunderstood very significantly. For example, at the end of the opera, just before the final, the final conclusion in which everybody comes forward, like the row of, of broccoli, as the Italians call them, and say, everything's just fine, isn't it? Uh, and they, and they, all, they all sing their little burlesque that, they, that concludes the opera. Before that, there is a big aria for the Conte d'Alma Viva, okay, that often you haven't heard, because many, many productions, and all lyric productions, for example, until last year, simply get rid of it. The reasons for getting rid of it are, to my mind, pretty stupid. That is, the reasons that have been put forward for getting rid of it have generally been, oh, Rossini didn't really mean it, and he was just writing this piece to suit performers, etc. Well, I mean, if you get rid of every piece of Italian opera that was written to suit performers, you won't have much left, right? Uh, furthermore, Rossini knew exactly what he was doing. He wrote this piece and called it, not Il Barbiere di Siviglia, he called it Alma Viva. Okay, why did he call it Alma Viva? Because he had the greatest tenor in the world as his Alma Viva, a man by the name of Emanuele Garcia. Garcia really was the greatest tenor at that period. And so the, what did Rossini do? He built the entire opera in such a way that it ended with the great aria for Garcia. Now, nobody else could sing it, which is why after a while the thing fell out of fell out of the opera and fell out of pretty much of the repertory. Not only did, did, could nobody else sing it, but the prima donna, Geltrude Righetti Giorgi, loved the piece so much that when the opera was redone several months later without Rossini's participation in Bologna, guess who sang the aria? <laughs> Righetti Giorgi, that's right. Furthermore, it, go, it, gets, it goes on from there. When, uh, when Righetti Giorgi, the next year, sang in Rossini's La Cenerentola for the first time, because she was the original Cinderella, everything builds to the final aria for, us, for, for Cinderella. What's the final aria? Basically, the aria for, for the, the count in, uh, in the Barber of Seville. Uh, non più mesta canto al fuoco. That's what the count sings at the end of the Barber of Seville. Now, it isn't the only time when Rossini uh, borrows from himself but you can imagine the situation. Here's our friend Righetti Giorgi turning around to him and said, Maestro, I want to sing that piece at the end. Rossini was 
very good about following the desires of his singers because he knew that the success of his operas depended upon the, the, his singers, his singers being content. This is hardly the only case. There's a famous example of, uh, of the opera Tancredi, one of Rossini's early serious operas, which he originally concluded with a happy ending of very much like the one in, uh, in The Barber of Seville. Then, because that happy ending goes against the original text of the opera, which comes from the Voltaire play, he actually wrote a tragic conclusion for it. Everybody hated it. You know, what's this tragic conclusion stuff? Uh, you know, going to end the opera with, with people, uh, with, with the hero dying? No, 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 no. And so that was given one time, and that was lost for almost 200 years. We were fortunate to find it again, uh, thanks to the family uh, whose ancestor wrote the words for the scene, who happened to have been the lover of the prima donna. And so uh, Rossini gave him a copy of this, of this piece, and, uh, and after, it, it, after it bombed, he gave him the autograph and said, okay, you hold it, no one else wants to hear this music again. So we found it, uh, and then it's been performed regularly since then, because what people wouldn't take in 1813, they're perfectly happy to take in, 20, in 2009. Uh, but later on, another prima donna, a very famous one by the name of Giuditta Pasta. Giuditta Pasta was the lady who, who first performed the role of Norma. You want to know how important she was, that's how important she was. Anyway. Judy Pasta said, I don't want to end the opera the way it's normally ended with this happy ending, you know, which everybody comes forward and sings how happy they are. No, I want a big aria at the end. Rossini said, yes, yes, I'll write you a big aria. But he never did it. So what did Judy Pasta do? She went and looked around at pieces that she liked, chose one, and said, okay, you didn't want to write me an aria. I'm going to sing one by Giuseppe Nicolini, that happens to be in my trunk. We used to call these things arie di baule, that is, trunk arias that the sopranos brought with them. But the story doesn't end there. The story ends with her turning around to Rossini and said, you wouldn't write me a piece, write me ornamentation for this. And he did. He did. I mean, I can, I can even play you some of that so you have some sense of, of what we're talking about. Uh, this is, uh, it concludes with a, with a, a final section we call a cabaletta, mm -hmm. that the text begins, or che son vicino a te, che so a fin di palpitar. This is what uh, Nicolini wrote. <laughs> you a piece, but I will ornament it for you so you can see, so it will sound better in your voice. And that's what Rossini did. So, as I say, the idea that a composer is not working with his singers, and that's all composers, is ridiculous. After all, a, a singer, a composer wants a piece to be successful. If his singers aren't happy, he's not going to have their cooperation, and he needs their cooperation for the piece to work. So, Rossini did indeed write a big aria for for uh, Garcia, which of course we include in the edition. Now, it's not as if it was ever not included before, but somehow or another, people seeing it bound like this, you know, say, oh well, I guess we better do it. And so recently, we've had performances of this almost everywhere. At the Metropolitan Opera, for example, uh, uh, Juan Diego Flores, who some of you may know, a remarkable tenor, uh, not only sings the piece, he gets a standing ovation of 15 minutes after he finishes it. Uh, and of course he does, because it's meant to be the highlight of the, of the show. And, uh, and, and so this, is, this, this has become now a pretty standard thing to do. A different tenor is singing there right now, a man by the name of Barry Banks, who's an excellent, excellent singer. And Barry, of course, is singing the aria, and it works fine. And nobody says, oh, Rossini really didn't mean it. Of course he meant it. Uh, that, in a way, though, is not a piece that is different in the new edition. The edition tries to begin with 
to get things right. Now, some of the things it gets right are things you won't necessarily immediately hear. You won't necessarily know that something was wrong before. I know it. When I listen to score a performance, I can tell the difference. But it's not as if the general public would necessarily know. Let me give you two examples from the very first page of the score. Okay? This is the, on the very first page of the score, the introduction, Rossini has a, only a limited number of staves available in his score. So what does he do? He puts the cello part and the counter bass part together on the same staff. Clear? He doesn't separate them. They're different. He doesn't separate them on different staves. He puts them on the same staff because on the first page, there's a lot going on. He's got to give a title. He's got to show all kinds of things. So what the cellos show is this. can play. They don't play down there. What does the bass do? The bass is written in a score, an octave above what it sounds. This is not the only instrument that this is true for. It's true for the piccolo. You write the piccolo with the same register as the flute, but it sounds an octave higher. Okay, just so you write the counter bass it's as if it were a cello, but it sounds an octave below. Trouble is that those notes can't be played by an instrument, by the instrument. But he's got, this phrase comes back several times during the course of the, of the number. Every other time that appears, it appears an octave higher, like this. time because he doesn't have space down it. He writes it in the he writes it as it sounds as opposed to how it how it should normally be notated. Would you believe that that has been misrepresented in every edition of the Barbara Seville until ours? It has always been misrepresented as if people of course no bass player could play it. So what they did was simply take it off an octave. I'm not suggesting that musicians are dumb. Musicians are very smart. They know their instruments, they know how to deal with these questions. But a printed edition should not allow that kind of nonsense to be continued. And we don't, we put it where it belongs. In that same passage, the music continues like this. Now notice that that figure is double dotted. show it as a single dot. Now, does the world come to an end because it's single dotted or double dotted? No, but Rossini clearly wrote the thing double dotted. Why should you hear it any other way? This isn't something you can't hear. You can hear that immediately. There's another example, a place where he got confused at first, but ultimately did it right. At the beginning of the big duet for, for Figaro and uh, the Count, Alidea di quel metallo, this is where our friend Figaro says, says, hearing about money, I get all filled, all interested, and I, I can do anything, you know, I'll, I'll, my mind will be a, a buzz and we'll, we'll figure out ways for you to get your Rosina. Okay, 
the the opening is straightforward. I'll leave the as far as you've ever heard it, except for last year at Lyric. Um, Balkan, um, Balkan, um, Balkan, um, Balkan, things as correct as it possibly can. But it goes way beyond that. The Barber of Seville is an opera that had existed for a very long time on the stage. Together with the Mozart operas, it is probably the longest, longest the piece that has been preserved the longest in an active repertory. As it never, never left the stage, it was being performed the entire 19th and 20th centuries and 21st centuries. It was written in 1816, so just a, you know, a couple of decades after the famous Mozart operas of the 1780s, things like Don Giovanni, Nozze di Figaro, Così van tutte, then a little bit later uh, before his death in 91 of the Magic Flute. But the opera did have an interesting history. And one thing that uh, a critical edition can do is to tell you something about that history, present some aspects of the history that are interesting. In this case, what we chose to do, we chose to do several things. First of all, there's a whole bunch of appendices. The first appendix to the score has Rossini's own ornamentation, that is, places where he told singers to sing differently from what was actually in the score. I'll talk about that in a minute, because I want to talk about the whole question of ornamentation. I'll come back to that. The other thing, though, that he did was in 1819, he was in Venice, to putting on an opera that isn't very interesting called Eduardo e Cristina. It's basically an effort to take some of his more important Neapolitan operas, because he was in Naples, I mean, mostly during this period, take some of his Neapolitan operas and present some of the highlights in, in a kind of pasticcio. Uh, well, the pasticcio doesn't work, needless to say, uh, but he was there, and there was somebody else there at that point, a singer. A singer who was, uh, uh, his name, her name was La Fodor Manvier. She was a French singer. She was a soprano. We know a lot about Fodor Manvier. Uh, because she went to Paris soon after and sang extensively at the Théâtre Italien 
He, she also sang, among other things, the role of Rosina in the Barber of Seville as a soprano, not as a mezzo-soprano or contralto, which is what was origi it was originally written for. So here she is, this soprano, singing the part, but she doesn't sound anything like Lily Pons, I assure you. She sounds exactly the same as the other singers of the time, and I'll talk about this a, a little bit later, uh, but she takes Rosina's opening aria, Una Voce Poco Fa, and she sings it a third higher in G major instead of in E major. Most sopranos today will sing it in F major, that is a little bit higher. But in G major, I don't know a single one who'd sing it. Now, how do we know this? We know it because the French actually published an edition of the piece Una voce poco fa, cavatine chantée par Madame Fodor dans le barbier de Seville, avec tous les agréments que Monsieur Madame Fodor y fait, écrit par elle-même, with all of the variations that Madame Fodor sings, written by herself. And we see immediately that this piece is in G major, so she's singing it very high but the, her variations are very similar to everything we would know uh, from other people. She just doesn't go down quite so low. She tends to go up. So for example, uh, when she sings Si lindoro mio sarà lo giurai la vincerò, this is what it shows. <laughs> And she gets to know Rossini, so what does she say to him? Maestro, I'd love to have an aria in the second act. Why don't you write me a new aria in the second act? And what does Maestro do? He writes her an aria. A se e ver che in tal momento. This aria has never been printed in modern times, but it's in print now, it's in our edition. Somebody has sung it, the person who sang it was Kathleen Battle who made a recording of the piece uh, in a disc that she, as an appendix to a disc she made with Claudio Abado and Placido Domingo in the early 1990s. And I know that, uh, what, I know the story because I was involved. Um, I heard from her management, she wanted to sing this piece she had heard of. Did I know where there was a copy of it? I said, sure, I know where there's a copy of it. And I sent it to her and she sang it. And I wrote a little piece in the program for it. But we have now, actually published this for the first time, and it is here as the second appendix, Recitativo ed Aria, Aggiunta da Rossini per Josephine Fodor Manvier. Uh, it's a lovely piece. It's a piece that, I don't know if everybody has to sing it. I mean, a, a mezzo-soprano would find it too high. If you've got a soprano, fine. Why not, if the soprano wants to do it? It does hold up the action a little bit. She sings it just before the tempest, okay? Uh, and, and she's just learned from, uh, Bartolo has just tried to convince her that, uh, that uh, the Count is playing dirty with her and is just trying to, this person she knows as Lindoro is playing dirty with her and is just trying to seduce her and then give her away to the ca that awful Count of Dalma Viva. He doesn't know yet that the Count Dalma Viva is Lindoro, okay? Uh, so she sings this lovely piece and she talks and she, in which she says, I hope it isn't true because I want to believe in his innocence. Let me just play you a few notes from the final section, the, Cav the Cavaletta, in which she says, L'innocenza di Lindoro de mi spela amor pietoso. A pity, 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 pitiful love. Uh, I hope that you can reveal to me his innocence. <laughs>
lovely piece. It's a little bit standard, shall we say, but it's nice, and Rossini did it. So that's our second appendix, because it's a piece actually by the composer, written for a specific occasion. But we also have a third appendix. The third appendix in the main score has to do with the two performances that were done of this opera in that very first year, 1816. Rossini wasn't directly involved with either of them, but in both cases there were important things that happened that were part of what, what represented the history of the Barber of Seville. So, for example, a few months after the first performance in Rome, in February of 1816, during the summer, the opera was presented in Bologna. This was the hometown of the prima donna, uh, Righetti Giorgi, okay? So he pre she presented it there, and a few changes were made. The most important change was in the so-called lesson scene. Now, this is a scene in which, as you probably know, prima donnas for ages have added anything they felt like adding. Uh, this is where they used to sing things like Home Sweet Home. Uh, Adelita Patti loved to do that in performances in England, um, and so on. Or they would take big arias from, from from other Rossini operas, Tancredi's Di Tanti Palpiti, or the Donna del Lago, uh, uh, Tanti Affetti in Tal Momento, and just shove them in. And because it was a lesson, it was she was supposed to be showing off, uh, you know, what she did. Rossini actually does something much more interesting in the original. They aren't. It isn't a great aria the way those arias are. Great arias, unforgettable arias. But it is a much more interesting situation because she says, I'm going to sing an aria from the opera L'Inutile Precauzione, The Useless Precaution. What is the subtitle of the opera? L'Inutile Precauzione. And a great deal of what happens in this opera has to do with uh, her saying, these are the new word. These are the words from the new opera, L'inutile precauzione. And Bartolo says, what is all that? What does that mean? Who cares? And this new music, I hate it anyway. Uh, he's very clear about that. Anyway, this aria from L'inutile precauzione, she sings uh, in, her, in, her, uh, in her lesson scene. And it begins by saying, it's useless for somebody to, to try to prevent someone who loves, contro un cor, okay, because ultimately the heart will win. During the first section of her aria, Bartolo falls asleep. He finds this music so boring that he can't possibly stay awake. So she gets out of character and goes back into the other opera, The Barber of Seville, and she addresses Lindoro directly. And she says, a Lindoro, mio tesoro, Say sapesse, if you only knew my beloved Lindoro, what it's been like here. Now that middle section, you know, is actually part of, you know, it's physically part of the opera we're watching. But then Bartolo begins to wake up again. So what does she do? She returns to L'Inutile Precauzione and she sings the other, the, the conclusion of that aria from this added opera. There's this wonderful joke, in other words, about being in a work and being outside of the work. The middle section is the one I want to play for you. This is, this is as, uh, as, as uh, Rossini writes it uh, originally. It goes like this. Alindoro mio tesoro, se sapessi se vedessi, questo cane di tutore, a che rabbia che mi fa. Don't temer, tira sicura, or not. 
wonderful combination. What you're going to do, of course, if you just add an aria from Tancredi, is you'll lose it all together. You don't have anymore that play of being in the opera and being outside the opera. In the very first season after the Rome debut, our friend Rigetti Giorgi already inserted a different piece there. But the fascinating thing about the piece that she inserted, which goes La Mia Pace, La Mia Calma, is that she made sure that in the middle they would continue singing Alindoro Mio Tesoro. So it is both a new piece and a piece that comes very close to the original. We don't have, we don't know even who wrote this piece. We don't have a clue who wrote it. But we nonetheless have included it in the edition because it seemed to us important to make people understand how this functions. This is the way the piece begins. instead of Rossini's original, what we're really saying is if you want to sing a piece from Tancredi or La Donna del Lago or whatever, remember that you can insert that middle section. So, you know, you can conclude, conclude the first part as in the Tancredi aria, you know, uh, uh, in which he sings uh, uh, about his homeland, uh, uh, how he's, how he's going to you know, he's come back to see, to see uh, uh, his Amenaida again, and he concludes, at which point you've got to sing Alindoro mio tesoro, say something, say say valessi, do that, and then you finish with her. He wakes up, and you attack. is that it is possible, and we can show how it worked historically, for you to take, put in a piece that you want to put in, but make it relevant the same way that Rossini did in his original piece. The other composition that we include is not from that production, but from the very next one, which took place in Florence late in the autumn of that same year. The person who was the musician in charge in Florence was a guy by the name of Pietro Romani. We know a lot about Pietro Romani because he was there for 40 years. He was still there when Verdi put on Macbeth in 1847. It was still the same Pietro Romani who was the musician in charge. Now, what did Pietro Romani do? Well, faced with a Don Bartolo who couldn't sing the very difficult aria, uh, Andator de la Mia Sorte, which has all of that incredible fast pattern uh, uh, with words and everything. Instead of that, he was asked to write a different piece, and so he did. Romani produced a piece called Manco un Folio. There's a page missing. Remember what happens here? Don Bartolo looks and sees that there are not, not as many sheets of paper as there should be, and so he says, what happened to this other sheet of paper? It's a paper on which she, of course, wrote her note to the, to the count or to the person she thinks is Lindoro. And she says, oh, I used it for a laundry list. And then the whole finale is about 
this law, this paper, uh, and the laundry list that she's supposed to uh, find on it, and etc. Okay, Mangum Folio became the aria to sing for everybody, not only in the 19th century, but into the early 20th century. I remember at one point going up to a very famous French professor at, uh, at uh, Princeton by the name of Victor Brombert. If any of you have any knowledge of the, of the, of the French industry, Brombert is a famous name. And I asked him about his, we were talking about opera, and he began singing for me, Mangun Folio. I said, how do you know that? He said, oh, they were still singing it when I was a kid in Russia. This is a piece that, as I said, was considered to be the aria for Don Bartolo for, for, for more than 100 years. And so what we've done is included that in the edition, trying to show, to demonstrate that this existed and that this was part of the history of it. Something else we've done that we actually hope someone will take advantage of this isn't in the main score, it's in the commentary. But Rossini was in Naples, as I said before, during most of the period of, uh, between 1815 and 1822. He didn't have anything to do with performances of the Barber of Seville there, but we do know that the Barber of Seville was performed mostly at the smaller theaters, not at the big theater, the Teatro San Carlo or the Teatro del Fondo, which didn't do uh, serious operas, but did comic operas. I mean, uh, sorry, the the, uh, the big theater didn't do comic operas, they only did serious operas. The comic operas were done at these smaller theaters. But they had a very special way to do them. They took the principal comic character and had him speak, not sing, in Neapolitan dialect. <laughs> these were Neapolitan dialect theaters. Rossini actually wrote one opera for the, uh, for the Teatro dei Fiorentini, which was one of them. Uh, and we have that, it's called La Gazzetta, and in it, one of the characters, Don, Don Pomponio, who is the kind of the, 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 the comic uh, hero, uh, sings and speaks, and speaks and sings recitative in, uh, in Neapolitan dialect. In the case of the Barber of Seville, L'Italiano in Algeria, and many, many other operas, they didn't do that at all. They cut all the seco recitative. They got rid of all of the recitative and instead had dialogue. And the dialogue had was all based around increasing the part of Don Bartolo and having him speak in dialogue. Some of it's amazingly funny. I can't do it all for you because my, my, Italian, my, my Neapolitan is not up to snuff. But suffice it to say that, that uh, he goes on and on, filling in all the details of the plot that we don't know anything about. For example, he says, I was originally from Naples, okay? And then I moved to Spain when all my patients in Naples began to die. <laughs> and now all my patients in Spain are dying. And he, and he talks about somebody he's dealing with right now. He says, he's got a problem, but the trouble is he can't tell me where it is. How do I know that he's got a problem here as opposed to there? If he's got a problem, it's his problem. He should be able to tell me. And he goes on and on like this. He, he calls the Count of Almaviva. He says, Almaviva, Alma Morta. What's the difference, right? <laughs> uh, maybe he's a live soul or a dead soul. And it, it's actually very funny as dialogue. Uh, if you've got the right buffo, you can easily imagine performing this opera at a smaller theater. I don't suggest this is something you should do at the biggest theaters in the world, but you can do it at a smaller theater with the text in Neapolitan. And we offer the entire Neapolitan text, which has been gone over, I'm happy to say, by the professor of Neapolitan at the University of Naples. So we know it's pretty much right. It's not easy to do this, by the way, because the early 19th, early 19th century Neo Neo Neapolitan was not a standardized language. It was a very literary language, not at all like what they do today. Uh, when you think of a Neapolitan uh, a dialect today, it's not the same thing. Uh, it's, it's much more complicated. And, uh, and fortunately, we've had people help us and be willing to talk to us about it. That because it involves just recitative, ju just, just spoken dialogue, we have in this volume and not in the other one, because it doesn't really belong in the other one. But what we do have in both volumes 
is a very particular approach to the question of ornamentation. Now, what you have to understand is that Rossini didn't, if you look at a Rossini score, you'll see there are a lot of places where there are repetitions. It's very typical of Rossini, that things be repeated. And if, if you look at what he wrote down, it looks as if it's the same music more than once. But we know that's not what he meant. How do we know? Well, among other things, we have a number of manuscripts in his own hand in which he shows us what he had in mind. Uh, this is one from the, li the library at the Milan Conservatory, and it is, in fact, for the, for the aria that, that uh, Rosina sings at the beginning, Una voce poco fa, uh, and it, it has her, the ornamentation that Rossini himself writes out for her for the entire part. Okay? Uh, we had a wonderful time with this, because when the opera was first restaged at La Scala in the early 1970s, it was restaged with the conductor Claudio Abado. And uh, the, the uh, person who, who directed it was, was a great uh, uh, stage director, uh, Jean-Pierre Ponel, Frenchman, uh, who, who, who did phenomenal work. And you've seen a number of his things in Chicago because they, they travel the whole world round. Uh, Ponel, Abado had decided that he didn't want to add anything to Rossini, even so that he, he did something that was totally wrong. Uh, he simply per per performed the works as written. Now, we know that this wasn't how it was meant to be done, but even when Abado wasn't there, Ponel had picked up this idea and, uh, and he was insisting that in this reprise of the opera in the mid-1970s, that no one had the right to do any ornamentation. I was in Milan at the time. It was being conducted by uh, Thomas Schippers, and the woman who was singing the role of Rosina is Frederica von Stade, okay? So hardly a tiny uh, personage. Frederica had arrived, or Flicka, as her friends call her, had arrived filled with ornaments that she was going to sing. And Ponell stopped the rehearsal and said, you can't do that. We do this as written. And Flicka said, I don't do it as written. That gets anti-historical. Anyway, they began to, have, there was a, 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 a row and they almost canceled the whole thing. At which point I was in the town, they gave a call and, and I and a friend came, came over there and I was able to say, look, this is an example of what Rossini thought he was doing because it was this manuscript happens to be in the library of the conservatory in Milan. I showed it to Ponel, and Ponel said, oh my God, did he really mean that? Let me give you an example of what this was like. Uh, so for example, uh, the passage, uh, a passage appears a second time like this. shows that singer to do it. Get the idea? I mean, this is, after you've heard this once, this is the second time round. He doesn't want it to be sung the same way the second time. He doesn't even want you to say, well, the first time I'll do it loud, the second time I'll do it soft. No, he changes the notes. Uh, and he expected that his singers would do it. Now, we have hundreds of manuscripts of Rossini of this kind, places where he has shown us examples of the way to think about re repetitions of material. So that in our first appendix of the critical edition, we offer singers all of the material that we have in Rossini's own hand related to the Barber of Seville. It turns out we have three pieces in which he ornamented for different singers. In one case, the, the Una Voce, Voce Poco Fa, we have three different versions of it. Some of them complete, some of them incomplete. Some of them are fascinating. So for example, you all know, you've all heard over and over again, the second time round, uh, she, Rosita comes to da 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 and then she goes up and says, ma. 
And then she begins, Masse mito kono, etc. Okay? That ma is Rossini's. He shows her how to do that. And it's in one of these manuscripts, so it's as clear as can be that this is his idea. Likewise, one of the famous uh, variations for that is We now have the manuscript in which he first did this. It is at the Fond Michat of the Brussels Conservatory, and I think I, I thought I brought it with me. Let's see whether I did. Maybe I, maybe I forgot. Ah, uh, well. Actually, I thought I had brought it, but maybe it didn't, didn't make it in here. Yes, I did bring it. Here it is. Okay? Not the whole thing. This line over here. But, uh, upside down. <laughs> there it is. Rossini's own idea to tell a singer what you could do. That's enough for us to understand where it comes from. Okay? Uh, there are lots of examples of this. There are examples of, of uh, from uh, the trio, for example. Uh, you don't think so much that this would be something he would do in a trio, but it is. Uh, this, for example, is, uh, hold on a second. This is the, uh, the way this trio, this is the trio at the end of the opera, uh, in which uh, uh, Figaro and the cat, and uh, sorry, uh, Rosina and the cat admit their love, and Figaro stands there commenting on the whole thing. But uh, a number of places, uh, there, are, there are passages in which uh, the music stops, and you say to yourself, hmm, what did they do there? Or in which there's a little cadenza, and you say, maybe they did more. Well, we have Rossini's own indication. So for example, she begins. of the Brussels Conservatory. It's another page of this material. But the edition goes beyond that, and this is the part I want to conclude on. You know, when you hear a singer from the 1930s or 1950s sing, and then still today, Pipe Beverly Sills, sing the uh, Una Voce Poco Fa, what they tend to, to sound like is comes out of this thing here. There was a singer by the name of Estelle Lieblin. She was Sills's teacher. And she actually published this thing, uh, edited by Estelle Liebling, Cavatina from the opera Il Barbiere di Siviglia. 
You cannot believe how many conservatory students are still learning the piece from this, okay? The trouble is that Miss Liebling's idea of what this music was like was determined by her experience with the bell song from Lachme, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the uh, role of Olamp in, uh, in the Tales of Hoffman. These were wonderful late 19th century examples of coloratura soprano, but they have nothing to do with Rossini's style. So for example, she concludes the opera, the, uh, the aria like this. <laughs> places in a piece where Rossini would introduce cadenzas. That's fine. There's lots of places where if you want to sing a high F, you can sing a high F, God help us. They generally sing it awfully, even when they sing it, uh, but that doesn't matter. If that's what they want to do, show themselves off, let them do it. What we have printed, and this, because it's not in Rossini's hand, but in the hand of other singers, we have here 75 pages not a small amount, in which we give 19th century ornamentation. These are all examples that we can say, this is what so-and-so sang at this theater in this year, on this date, in many cases. We can say that on the, in 1827, in April at Covent Garden, the following singer sang the following ornamentation because they published it afterwards and we could sing, see what was there, okay? And we have all of these examples. We know, for example, that, that there's a series, there's a notebook that belonged to a singer by the name of Adelaide Kemble. Adelaide Kemble was an important singer in the 1830s. She was the sister of someone who you may all know, a woman by the name of Fanny Kemble. Fanny Kemble was one of the great actresses of the 19th century, and she left England and moved to America, where she was one of the great people on the stage in the whole period. Fanny Kemble was, you know, the top, top actress of the time. Okay, but Adelaide, instead, was a singer. She went to Italy and studied with, guess who, Giuditta Pasta. And we have her notebook that came from the period in which she worked with Pasta. This notebook con contains, for example, all the ornamentation for Norma, the entire opera, piece by piece. I don't say you have to do it that way, but if you want to know what probably Judith de Pasta did, this is the place to look, because she was teaching her students how to do it through this. Now, we have Adelaide Kemble's or uh, autograph uh, her, in her notebook, there's a series of ornamentation for the Barber of Seville. We printed it here, okay? Uh, the singer uh, Laura, Laura Cinti d'Amoro was a very important singer in Paris in the 1820s to the 1840s. What do we know about her? We know that Rossini wrote the part of the Comtesse de Folleville in Il Viaggio a Rance for her, and when he moved to the Paris Opera, she sang the soprano lead in all four of his French operas, which means she was the first Matilda in Guillaume Tell, she was the first Adele in Contori, and so on. When she was finished singing with Rossini, she went, went on and sang for Meyerbeer. She was the first soprano soloist in Robert le Diable in 1831. And when her voice began to get a little bit less in control, she went and became the teacher of voice at the Paris Conservatoire, okay? She published towards the, in the 1847, a bunch of, of ornamentation of the kind that she taught to her classes. More important still, at the Lilly Library at Indiana University, we have five notebooks filled to the brim with her suggested ornamentation for her repertory. And she's got, of course, several examples from Una Voce Poco Fa, but that's hardly all. 
I, I particularly love what she does with uh, Norma because most people think that if you can sing Casta Diva, the first part, you should stop and you shouldn't sing the last part. A bello a me ritorno, di la di la 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 Well, she shows an ornamentation for that. Let me tell you, it's dynamite, you know. Uh, and the voice just keeps going and going and moving and moving. Uh, it's, if anybody can, who God knows if anybody could do it today. Uh, uh, but but it, but it, that's you know so we know who she was we know when she sang these parts we know who she taught them to etc. Let me give you some idea of what we're talking about. Uh, this, for example, because because the Cavatina of Rosina is probably the most significant piece a piece that exists in so many different versions. This is uh, the cadenza at the end of the first part, Lo Giurai. La Vincero. In addition to Rossini's own three versions of that, we have all of these versions from singers of the period. This is from uh, a book of variations that was worked out by the son of Emanuele Garcia, who was the first, the first uh, uh, Count Dalmaviva. sense of how you could go about it to create a version of the part that's right for your voice, for your vocality, but at the same time was within the style that singers of the time and Rossini himself would have recognized. All of these elements are elements that enter into deciding what to put in a critical edition. Because a critical edition doesn't end with the notion of, oh, well, we want to get the notes right. Of course we want to get the notes right, and the rhythms right, and the, and the orchestration right. Of course we want to do all of that. But the point of the operation is much broader. It tries to place a composition in a historical framework by uh, paying attention to all of these other elements of it. Some of them are going to be really important for performers today. Some of them are not. I don't think anybody's going to want to sing Magnum Folio today. But it's nice to have it available. Uh, I don't think anybody will sing La Mia Pace, La Mia Calma, but if some singer decides that they want to add uh, Di Tanti Palpiti and put this as a kind of middle section the way they did in La Mia Pace, La Mia Calma, I will be very happy. I will think we have done our job, etc. So uh, that's, that's uh, what I wanted to tell you today. Enjoy the rest of the day. I hope uh, it's 10.30, so I will stop. Uh, and, uh, and I look forward to you. Which two of your bar cleaners here? She's saying.
tango theme song with a lot of ornamentation. Yes. Is it similar to what you are discovering? Well, I did those for Cecilia when she was here. So, <laughs> so yes, it was certainly similar. Uh, that whole repertoire, the whole recording she made of all the Rossini songs came from my work. Okay, uh, I know her well. I invited her to come and give that recital, and uh, and yes, uh, it is. She, she really understands what to do. Peter? To get rid of a song called Inutile Precazione, when that's the subtitle of the opera, and really important, it seems to me is is uh, is really defeating part of the point of the, the piece. I couldn't agree more, but let me tell you, there are many people who don't feel that way. Their attitude is, oh, somebody else did it that way, so I'll do it too. And that's the end. They don't, they don't ask the question beyond that. Uh, it's just the way life is. I mean, I, I often tell the story of my experience with a great singer, a great singer, Piero Cappuccini, when he came here to do Ernani. I pointed out to him that some of the words he was singing made no sense whatsoever. <laughs> and his response was, I don't care. I've always sung it this way, I'm going to continue singing it this way. It's a place where Silva, where, where the king turns around to Silva, and according to the old edition, because the edition was wrong, he sang, Il tuo capo traditore, altro scampo non non ve, non no, non ve, non no, non ve. What sense does that make? Your head, traitor, there's no other escape? Not giving him much of a choice, is he? Uh, and in fact, Silva's not the traitor. The traitor is Hernani, who Silva has hid behind a picture. Verdi actually wrote a text that is much closer to the original Victor Hugo, which goes, il tuo capo, il traditore. I'll have your head, or you give me the traitor. Meaning Hernani, altro scampo non non ve. Now he's got a choice. But you see, it doesn't give the singer quite the opportunity to yell at, at Silva, <laughs> oh, traditor! Right. And they love it. They love it. So, <laughs> I, it's not as if I don't understand the mechanism. I understand the mechanism, but I would like to hope that we can allow sense to, 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 to prevail. It doesn't always. Mm -hmm. Do sopranos nowadays write down all of the, the ornamentations that they use? All, you know, the business about, about about uh, uh, improvising ornamentation. I, in all the years I've worked in the theater, and I've worked there for 40 years, I only know one singer, one singer who actually improvised. And that was a woman by the name of Cecilia Gastia, who was a wonderful singer from the mid 80s into 90s. Then she got ill, and she continues to sing, but she's not the same person she was then. She was here at one point and sang in a brilliant performance of Caponetti Montecchi with, uh, with uh, what's her name, the, uh, the marvelous American uh, uh, mezzo who died. Uh, you know, you all know who I mean. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, God, the name's gone out of my head. I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, 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 it was a wonderful performance, a simply <coughs> wonderful performance. She was someone who could get up on stage and sing you four different variations for a passage without blinking. She was a wonderful musician. And the trouble is, you've got to remember, it's not the same as improvising in jazz. Improvising in jazz, you've got four people playing, right? And they're very good musicians. And they hear you go do something strange, and they, get, they can follow you. Here, you've got 100 players out there. They've got written parts. If you do something that gets you harmonically in trouble, you've had it. There's no way they can fix it, right? And that's why. I mean, even a great singer like Marilyn Horn always had it written out. That didn't mean that she wasn't willing to make little adjustments and a nip here or a tuck there. Of course she did. And she would do it on, on successive nights. If something wasn't working, she'd fix it the next night. I mean, I've, I've watched her do, do this in, in performance after performance. She was magnificent. But in her case, she had an accompanist by the name of Martin Katz, who currently teaches at the University of Michigan, who's brilliant and who prepares this material for her. She learned the material from Marty, and then she made it her own. That's what happens, and it's what has always happened. I'm convinced it happened in the 19th century, too. Mm -hmm. When you uh, come across original manuscripts, those that I've seen in facsimile look impossible to look at, or look at Beethoven, it's all scribbled. Beethoven is the worst. Yeah. But 
Well, you come across it. How do you decipher them to begin with before you start even to analyze? Well, you have to. I mean, you know, in the last couple of weeks, for example, I had the, the great pleasure of meeting for the first time a woman by the name of Charlotte de Rothschild. And yes, she's from the Rothschild family. She, her family had an autograph album back in the 19th century. And this autograph album, which they called the Livre d'Or, the Golden Book, uh, has entire songs by Rossini, by Donizetti, by Bellini. It has an entire mazurka by Chopin in Chopin's hand. Now, how do you decipher it? First of all, you know the handwriting of these different people. And so you can you more or less know what to expect. Uh, and then you, 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 know, you have a lot of, I've, I've got you know, 40 years of experience looking at this stuff, and it's, you learn how to do it. Uh, I mean, my wife is a, is a scholar of Shakespeare, and you have to learn what Elizabethan hand is like. Once you know the Elizabethan hand, it's possible to, to uh, transcribe material that otherwise you couldn't transcribe. The case of Beethoven, of course, is the worst, because Beethoven really was writing scribbles. Uh, and as I, because I, I'm interested in Beethoven sketches, and I've worked on them, and I've taught them, etc. And as I've said to many classes here at the university, the only way to transcribe a Beethoven sketch is to know what he wrote. Once you know what he wrote, then you can transcribe it. You got to be a little careful to to, to impose your vision of it uh, when, when you really don't know. Uh, but basically, you know, you know he didn't write. Write that he wrote, you know, and, and that's all. There, there's no evidence that that melody was ever anything but that, and and so the fact that the notes a little higher or a little lower is irrelevant. You just have to know what's there, and then you can figure it out. It's not easy. Uh, I'm happy to say that Rossini, Bellini, Donizetti, Verdi are much simpler in comparison. <laughs> Others? Yes. Do you feel the same way about the modernizing? You know, I've written extensively about that in, uh, in my book, Divas and Scholars, which, which was published by the University of Chicago Press in 2006, about to come out in, in, in uh, Italian translation uh, later this year. Uh, I think it's important to make differentiations between different kinds of staging. Uh, there is the, the kind of, diff of, of changes that involve moving from one period to another. Verdi did it always. He was forced to do it. He had no choice. And his attitude was, I'm willing to move the place and the time, just don't change me the characters and their relationship to one another. So I mean, you know, the Duke of Mantua was originally Francois Premier of, uh, of France. The whole thing was a French opera. Malo and Masca is the stupidest of all because there we go, we, we are over here in, in Boston. <laughs> Does that mean masked balls in Boston? Of course it didn't. It occurs in, in Sweden. But he was forced to make so many changes in the words that performers are resistant to the notion that, that you can go back to the Swedish thing by changing a lot of words and following what Verdi wrote originally. There are, there are a lot of people who don't want to do that. And so what they do is they make it up, you know, and some of the things they make up are pretty funny. I mean, did you know when they send back, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll put it in, in, uh, in Sweden, okay? But then when, when, uh, when uh, Gustavo sends back to the home country, um, um, uh, Angestrom becomes Renato and Amelia, he sends them across the wide ocean. <laughs> to Finland? <laughs> uh, uh, or there's a great spot in the in the first act where they talk about Ulrika, you know, and and, and it, it, this is the the, the 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 lady who is the Sybil, uh, and uh, when he brought the thing to uh, to Boston, he changed that to read Ulrika uh, del sangue. Uh, uh, no, what's what's the word? Del infame sangue dei negri. Now you can't say that anymore. Of course you can. So everybody changes it. What do they change it to? Del infame sangue dei gitani, gypsies. Can you imagine this being said in Europe today? You know, where the whole problem of gypsies is every bit as strong as the problem of blacks in America. It makes no sense at all. What did Verdi originally wrote? He originally wrote 
Uh, Ulrika la Sibila. Ulrika the Sibyl, that's all you have to say. It's easy, the easiest pie, but they don't do it because it's not the standard. So you end up with these standard changes, some of which make no sense at all. Now, that is one kind of change. The other kind of change, and that's what you're really talking about, is what I call radical staging, in which you pay no attention to what's going on in the story, etc. And there, there's a lot more to discuss. Uh, whether some, sometimes, sometimes I've seen things that have worked, sometimes I've seen things that have, that have been awful. Uh, and and uh, I'm not willing to say that it's always awful, because it's not always awful, but there are a lot of times when it is. I, sh I should stop. I have one yeah, question, one. just about why you do a critical edition. Isn't it to change the way we understand the opera or any, any particular work? Is that really what underlines what, what motivates is an understanding that in the 19th, the, the scores published in the 19th century were published in a way that paid no attention. I mean, the Barber of Seville, for example, where Cordy published it, they didn't even have Rossini's manuscript available. So they took whatever they found and they just recopied it. Right? So that you really try to say, I care about this composer and I want this music to be performed as best it can and I think he knew more than you know more than I know. And so let's try to get Mandel. I should stop.